In this lecture, we will discuss methods for determining the actual and the potential evapotranspiration of crops, which means methods for measuring evapotranspiration and methods for calculating and stress evapotranspiration. We will start with the measurement of evapotranspiration using lysimeters, the water balance equation, or micrometeorological methods. Then we will review the process of evaporation from the soil surface, as it is an important component of evapotranspiration of crops. Then we will use the penman monteith equation to discuss which factors affect evapotranspiration and the concept of atmospheric coupling. Finally, we will review the calculation of potential evapotranspiration using the FAO method, which is based on reference ET, ETO, and the use of clock coefficients. And finally, we will also discuss a simple method for estimating transpiration. The contents of this lecture are based on chapters 3 to 10 of our book Principles of Agronomy for Sustainable Agriculture. Evapotranspiration is the sum of evaporation from all possible sources in the crop. That includes evaporation from the soil surface, transpiration from the plant, and also evaporation from the wetted surfaces of the plant when they are wet by rainfall or irrigation. During most of the time, mostly in irrigated crops, the plants are going to be dry, so the two components of evapotranspiration will be only soil evaporation and transpiration from the plants. The measurement of evapotranspiration can be performed using lysimeters, using the water balance, or using micrometeorological methods like the energy balance, the aerodynamic method, or eddy covariance. Today we will not review the aerodynamic method. For the measurement of soil evaporation, typically we use mini lysimeters. And in the past few years, a new technique, the heat pulse technique, can also be used for detailed measurements in short-term uh, periods. Lysimeters are the best alternative for measuring evapotranspiration. They determine evapotranspiration as the loss in mass of a huge volume of soil which has the roots of the crop. This is really the only true measurement of ET available. It means a high cost for construction of the lysimeter and it is very sensitive to differences inside the lysimeter and outside in soil conditions or crop conditions. It is located on a permanent uh, location, which is fixed, we cannot move it, and it uh, represents a rather small uh, area between 3 and 30 square meters. The temporal scale is rather long, going from a few hours to one day, typically. Here we have a diagram of the weighing lysimeter, where we have a soil monolith, which is on top of a weighing system, in this case load cells. We have also a collection tank for drainage and a data logger for uh, for storing the data. We have a hatch for accessing the uh, lysimeter. Here is a picture of one of the first lysimeters built in Spain. And here we see 
the blue lines uh, outline or mark the edges of the lysimeter which is 2 by 3 and 1.5 in depth here we have a crop of sunflower here is the access the hatch for accessing uh, the uh, weighing lysimeter another view of the same lysimeter we see here one and two uh, access tubes for neutron proof measurements just to check the soil water content profiles and here we see that around the lysimeter we might found we might find some plants that are missing or some small plants because of compaction during operation normal operation of the lysimeter which includes weeding or measuring the soil water content etc so it can be challenging keeping or trying to keep the conditions inside the lysimeter and outside equal here we have a picture of the Wayne lysimeter at the Michigan State University Kellogg Biological Station which is located in Battle Creek Michigan this is a smaller lysimeter here we see the walls you can uh, you can see the outer and inner wall of the lysimeter here we have also access tubes for neutron proof this is a maize uh, crop and uh, this uh, lysimeter was located in a rainout shelter for uh, water stress experiments in this picture we can see another way lysimeter located in Cordoba and here we have an almond tree a single almond tree occupying the big like this big lysimeter here the problem will be having similar size and similar status of the tree in the lysimeter and the trees outside as we have trees and the trees are perennial the problems to keep the equal conditions might be more uh, more severe as uh, any difference in condition will accumulate in a, in a pluriannual plant a cheaper and simpler alternative to lysimeters is the use of the water balance equation here we can say that the increase in soil water content is equal to the sum of rainfall irrigation and discounting evapotranspiration deep percolation and surface runoff we can use this equation different ways if we perform soil sampling we can deduce evapotranspiration as the sum of rainfall irrigation discounting the increase in soil water content measured by a sequential soil sampling in this case we are assuming that deep percolation is negligible and surface runoff is negligible we have an alternative instead of measuring soil water content for longer periods if we consider that the variation in soil water content is very small between two dates we can say that evapotranspiration is the sum of rainfall irrigation discounting the deep percolation which is actually measured using a drainage lysimeter of course both methods will require rather long periods usually longer than one week if we choose the soil water balance with measurements of soil water content we have several alternatives the direct measuring of soil water content by soil sampling is the cheapest and simplest way of doing that but has the disadvantage of being destructive we cannot measure the same sample twice 
and also of requiring a lot of labor. Typically, we will use indirect uh, methods, and that includes electronic uh, methods like TDR, FDR, and the neutron proof. The neutron proof is very accurate, it's rather expensive, and has an important disadvantage of the security issues by uh, because it uses a radioactive source for detecting salt water. The TDR measures the dielectric constant of the soil which is related to soil water content. It is rather expensive, it is very accurate, but the main disadvantage is that it can only detect a small volume around the proofs. The FDR also measures the dielectric constant of the soil. It is cheaper, but it is also less reliable. The, those methods that uh, determine the dielectric constant of the soil have an important problem, which is that they are affected by salinity. So under saline conditions, the, uh, the data will not be accurate. And in general, the main disadvantage of those electronic uh, uh, devices is that the volume of soil detected is very small, only a few centimeters around the proofs. The spatial scale, when we apply the soil water balance with uh, measurements of soil water content, is less than one square meter, it's rather small. And the temporal scale is rather long, minimum several days. Here we see a bimeter tube for soil sampling, which is inserted by percussion in the soil and is a, a very fast method for soil sampling. However, it will be challenging sampling the soil in uh, in hard soils where the penetration resistance is high and we have a large uh, and we when we have a large percentage of stones here we see a diagram of a neutron proof operating at different depths in the soil here in a dry layer or here in a wet layer the principle of the neutron proof is that fast neutrons, in other words, high energy neutrons, which are emitted by radiate, uh, radioactive sources, will interact mostly with hydrogen atoms, which are associated mostly with water. When they interact with hydrogen, they are converted to slow nitrogen, slow energy um, neutrons, which can be detected using a specific detector. So the neutron proof consists of a source of high energy neutrons and also a detector of low energy neutrons. It is inserted into the soil using an access tube and, which, and then we can move the detector to different depths for measuring the soil, quart, uh, soil water content around. As the measurement is related to interactions with uh, hydrogen, if we are on a dry layer where the soil water content is lower, the radius of influence will be larger because the fast neutrons will be able to travel farther from the source before, being, uh, before colliding with a hydrogen atom. Therefore, the radius of the detec uh, detection will be larger. If the soil is wetter, like here, the radius will be smaller. Micrometeorological methods include those related to the uh, energy balance of the crop and eddy covariance. Eddy covariance is the most sophisticated method micrometeorological method for measuring evapotranspiration and also other scalars like CO2. It is very expensive and complex instrumentation 
and it's based on detection of different scalars or wind at very high frequency, up to 10 Hz. Apart from a high cost, it has the advantage, it has an advantage, which is that we can transport the instrument. It can be installed in a few hours on a new location and kept there for, let's say, a few days and then move it for, to another location. The spatial scale of measurement is rather large, so we will be detecting with this sensor, we will detect fluxes of evapotranspiration of CO2 from distances between 100 to 100 meters, depending on the height of the instrument, and the temporal scale is typically around 30 minutes. So we can perform, we can measure the time course of evapotranspiration throughout the day using eddy covariance. It is only used in research. Here we see a, a system, a, an eddy covariance system operating on cotton close to Cordoba. Here we see the, that is the sensor for measuring water vapor and CO2 with high frequency. Here we see the uh, uh, sonic anemometer, a net radiometer, and here is the box where the data logger is located. A closer look at one uh, system for eddy covariance is here we have the net radiometer. This is a Krypton hygrometer for measuring variations in water vapor concentration. Here we have a sonic anemometer. And here we have the housing where we have a sensor for measuring air temperature and air humidity. This is another eddy covariant system on a garlic crop. We see here that we have a much larger area. Here we have the Krypton hygrometer. This is a, an infrared thermometer looking measuring the temperature of the crop. Here we have a net, radi a net radiometer. Here we have the sonic anemometer. Closer look of the same uh, equipment with the 3D sonic anemometer which measures the three direction, the uh, three axis components of wind speed. And here we have the hygrometer, and here we have a, a thermocouple. The hygrometer will be used to measure evapotranspiration, and the thermocouple will be used to measure a sensible heat flux. The principle of eddy covariance is that we, if we measure at high frequency and a packet of air, well, a humid air goes from the crop to the atmosphere, we will detect a peak in the vertical wind velocity and the air humidity at the time when the uh, parcel goes by. Something similar happens if we have dry, hot air coming down from the atmosphere to the crop. We would detect a decrease in vertical wind velocity because the wind velocity is negative here. We will also detect a decrease in the air humidity because the parcel is drier than the average. We can perform the sum of the deviations of vertical wind velocity and multiply that by the deviation of water vapor concentration. We sum those and divide by the number of data. Using the notation of a decovariance, we will be averaging the product of deviations of vertical wind by the deviations 
in absolute humidity Q and that average will give us directly the flux of evapotranspiration at that height. The energy balance Bowen ratio is based on accurate measurements of net radiation and soil heat flux and typically will use sensors of temperature and humidity at two heights so it is less expensive instrumentation than that of a decovariance so the cost will be lower and similarly to a decovariance you can transport the equipment to different places has a similar spatial scale between 100 200 meters around the sensor and temporal scales around half an hour it will not work under specific conditions for instance when the Bowen ratio tends to minus one in other words when uh, letting heat flux is equal to minus sensible heat flux then the method is indeterminate some analysis have shown that uh, typically the conditions where the bone ratio does not work are around 20-30% of the time under summer conditions. In theory, it should not uh, work well under conditions of incomplete cover. Here we see a picture of a commercial system for bone ratio that measures the temperature and humidity at two different heights to determine the Bowen ratio. Okay, evaporation from the soil surface, it is an important, is an important component of, evapotra of evapotranspiration, basically when we have partial covered conditions. For a bare soil, evaporation follows three stages, as described by Philip. We have first a uh, first stage, so-called energy limited, after wetting the soil, and during that stage, evaporation from the soil is very close to evaporation from a grass canopy that will happen until an amount of evaporation occurs and the soil surface starts to dry and after that soil evaporation will decrease rapidly down to very low values this is the second stage also called soil limited stage after that when the soil is very dry we have a third stage <coughs> when most soil evaporation uh, mo most uh, movement of water in the soil occurs as water vapor. For uh, soil uh, for irrigated uh, crops, the soil will be typically in either stage one or stage two, and never in stage three. In stage two. Mathematically, soil evaporation can be calculated as a function of root, the square root of time after soil wetting. Using these equations, we can using the equations of evaporation in, during stage one and stage two, we can calculate the average evaporation for a given period. The uh, variables here will be reference evapotranspiration, in other words, the evaporation of grass, which can be calculated using climatic data, the wetting interval, the interval between wetting events, the wetting duration, and two parameters related to the soil, which are U sub V and C sub V. U sub V is the sum of evaporation in stage one and might be as low as 5 to 6 millimeters for well-drained soils up to more than 10 millimeters for clay soils. C sub V 
is a constant dependent on the soil type, although many times we can assume it is 3.5. Using that equation, here we uh, show what is the variation in the mean soil evaporation relative to evapotranspiration as a function of the wetting interval, the interval between wetting events, for three values of ETO. For instance, 3 millimeters day, 5 millimeters day, and 7 millimeters day. This would be conditions of March in Cordoba, conditions of May in Cordoba, conditions of July in Cordoba, midsummer. We can say that the average soil evaporation divided by reference evapotranspiration will be high when the wetting interval is short, like here. We see that in the spring during March, if we have a wetting interval of four days, the soil evaporation will be equal to reference evapotranspiration. We see that in summer, if we have a wetting interval of four, the fraction, the ratio of soil evaporation to uh, ETO would be uh, a little higher than 0 0.6. If the wetting interval increases, the soil evaporation is reduced. For instance, if the frequency of uh, the wetting interval is 14 days every two weeks, we see that in spring we would have a value of 0 0.5 for the ratio uh, soil evaporation to ETO and less than 0 0.3 during the summer. If we want, we can also apply these equations to what happens when we have already a crop. In other words, we can calculate evaporation from the soil surface below the canopy or below crop residues. Roughly, soil evaporation during stage 1, which is energy limited evaporation, will be equal to reference evapotranspiration multiplied by 1 minus the fraction of radiation intercepted by the crop canopy. In other words, the fraction of radiation not reaching the soil surface. The same approach can be applied when instead of a canopy what we, what we have on top of the soil are crop residues. The pema montis equation is shown here and let us remind that the main uh, utility of this equation is that it can uh, help us in separating climatic and crop effects on evapotranspiration. Latent heat flux Le is a function of delta, which is the slope of the saturation vapor pressure versus temperature, so it is a function of temperature net radiation, which is a function of solar radiation and long wave radiation losses, soil heat flux, BPD, which is the vapor pressure deficit, the difference between saturation vapor pressure and actual vapor pressure. And here we have also two coefficients that are the aerodynamic resistance and the canopy resistance. The aerodynamic resistance depends on wind speed and the surface roughness, so it is partially affected by climatic conditions, by wind speed, but it is also affected by crop characteristics, like the crop roughness. RC, the canopy resistance, is the average or reflects the average the stomatal closure of the canopy. So RC can change 
in general as RC as stomatal closure increases LE would will decrease we can use the penman monteith equation to analyze what happens when we have string conditions for instance when aerodynamic resistance is very high and BPD is very low, evapotranspiration, as given by the penman monteith equation, reduces to this equation, which is called equilibrium evaporation, where evapotranspiration is a function of delta, of net radiation, and G, soil heat flux, and here we have also delta and gamma, which is the psychrometric constant. Opposed to that, we have conditions where aerodynamic uh, resistance is negligible, it's very small. In that case, the Pema Monteith equation reduces to this equation, which is called imposed evaporation, where evapotranspiration is a function only of RC, canopy resistance, and BPD. <coughs> Rho, CP, and gamma are constants. Rho is air density, CP is the specific heat of air at constant pressure, and gamma is the psychrometric constant. We see that these extremes, the imposed evaporation and equilibrium evaporation, mark the concept of coupling of crops with the atmosphere. We say that a, a crop is coupled to the atmosphere when aerodynamic resistance is very low, so we can calculate evaporation using the imposed evaporation equation. On the other hand, we talk about a decoupled canopy when Ra is very high, so evapotranspiration can be calculated using the equilibrium equation seen before. Here we see in the center we, uh, we write the penman monteith equation and as extremes we have equilibrium evaporation or imposed evaporation. We move from one to the other by increasing BPD, we move from equilibrium to imposed and by increasing aerodynamic resistance we move to equilibrium evaporation. And that will be the case of conditions of low winds, very smooth, low estative crops, close canopies, li big leaves, and inside greenhouses. On the other hand, conditions of imposed, imposed evaporation will occur under strong winds, tall crops, sparse canopies, small leaves, rather rough canopies like orchards and forests. Let's talk a bit about the calculation of potential crop evapotranspiration. We are interested in calculating, for instance, the evapotranspiration of irrigated crops where we will avoid water stress. Therefore, we calculate the so-called potential crop evapotranspiration. And usually we will follow the FAO methodology, which calculates evapotranspiration as the product of Kc crop coefficient and ETO, reference evapotranspiration. The crop coefficient will depend on ground cover and soil water content for potential and soil water content in the soil surface, and ETO will depend on climatic variables. Reference evapotranspiration is defined as the evapotranspiration rate of a short green crop, grass, completely shading the ground of uniform height of 0 0.12 meters and with adequate water status in the soil profile. Reference evapotranspiration can be calculated using many different methods, but we will only review two. The first is the Hargraves equation, which 
is very peculiar as it only requires values of air temperature. In this equation, ETO is calculated as a function of extraterrestrial radiation, which is calculated, average measured temperature, and maximum and minimum temperature. Here we have also a coefficient that changes when we are inland or we are in the coast. This equation is very useful as it considers extraterrestrial radiation, therefore that gives the maximum possible radiation on a given site. Then the actual radiation is reflected by using the difference between maximum and minimum temperature. So you can think when we have conditions of low uh, atmospheric transmissivity, if we have a lot of clouds, the difference between maximum and minimum temperature will be small. When we have clear sky conditions, we will have maximum values of the difference between maximum and minimum temperature. So by using the, this temperature amplitude, we will be reflecting the conditions of atmospheric transmissivity. And then using the atmospheric, uh, uh, the extraterrestrial radiation, we will come up with something which is related to actual solar radiation. The best alternative, and now is the most uh, extended reference for calculating ETO, is the Pema Montes FAO equation, which uses the four variables that affect uh, evapotranspiration. This is an, uh, simply an application of the Pema Montes equation to a specific crop, which is a grass of 0 0.12 meters height and a height and a canopy resistance of 69 seconds per meter. Then the ETO will be calculated as a function of temperature as it affects delta, net radiation or solar radiation as it affects uh, net radiation, then BPD, vapor pressure deficit, and wind speed measured at 2 meters height. And that will give the reference evapotranspiration. We will use weather stations like this, like shown in, that, in this picture, where uh, we measure solar radiation using a pyranometer. We measure the wind speed using an anemometer. We also measure the wind direction using a vane, although it is not required for the calculation. Typically, we will not use net radiations like here, but only uh, so solar radiation measurement with the pyranometer and uh, long wave radiation is going to be calculated. And here we have the housing for the temperature and humidity proof, which is this one. The data from this type of weather station will be collected automatically and shown on internet every day, like in this case, which shows one weather station belonging to the network of weather stations of the Instituto de Agricultura Sostenible in Córdoba. And the page will show every day the main values of climatic variables and also it will include the reference evapotranspiration. Just in case, it also gives us the, condi the conditions of the past night, basically temperature and rainfall during the, uh, the last night. Here we see the variations throughout the year of reference evapotranspiration on a single location from 2000 to 2013. These are the dots shown here. We see a lot of variability and the stars represent the step, uh, the month number rule, which is one for January, two for February, up to seven for the month of July, then August, six, September, five, then we jump two to October, three, November, two, and December, one.
that give us an idea if you don't have the data but that can give you an idea of the typical values of evapotranspiration in the south of Spain or the south of Italy for instance The other component of the calculation of evapotranspiration is that related to the crop coefficient. The crop coefficient is the ratio of actual evapot uh, crop evapotranspiration and reference evapotranspiration. The maximum values are typically around 1.2. They are smaller for shorter crops and higher for taller crops. The final value of the crop coefficient depends on the water content of the crop at the time of harvest. For instance, if we grow beans, for dry beans, the final crop coefficient will be as low as 0.25. But, but if we are growing green be beans, so we collect them green, the crop coefficient at harvest will be as high as 1.1. The initial crop coefficient is calculated using these formulas or the formulas for soil evaporation that we have seen before. And these are the formulas uh, suggested by FAO. You can find them in the book. Here we see the crop coefficient curve as a function of time. To define this curve, we need the duration of this four stages a b c d which are the four uh, in the four um, intervals which we use to divide the crop cycle we have first an initial stage where we apply the initial crop coefficient which is a function of the wetting interval and eto we have then a maximum crop coefficient and then we have a final crop coefficient at the end. The tables include the durations of the uh, of the intervals a, b, c and d and the values of kc max and kc final kc here. Here are the tables are shown in our book for different crops. We have the durations of A, B, C and D intervals and the values of KC mid and KC at the end of the growing season. This is another part of the same table with the durations of the crops, the duration of the intervals and the values of mid and final crop coefficient. Here we see one possible, uh, one possible effect of the special conditions on a given year on the actual evapotranspiration and therefore on the crop coefficient. Here we see values of evapotranspiration of cotton during stages A, which is the initial stage, it would go from here to here and then we have the increasing stage but here and here we have rainfall this clearly shows that after rainfall the crop coefficient increases quite a lot as the soil is wet and we are on stage one evaporation therefore we can expect a lot of variability in the crop coefficient for the initial phase and that is related to more or less rainfall during a wet year the initial crop coefficient will be high and in a dry year the initial crop coefficient will be low and the difference can be very important we will also have a variability in crop coefficients associated to the different duration of the crop phases for different years. These durations will depend on the crop cycle, on the cultivar, but also on the temperature. If, the year, uh, if a given year is colder than average, the intervals will be longer, and if the, uh, this year is hotter than the average, the duration of the interval 
if we want, we can uh, calculate the crop coefficient as a function of the ground cover using this equation. In this equation, the crop coefficient is calculated as the initial crop coefficient at the end of the initial stage. The crop coefficient at the end of the rapid growth stage, in other words, this is the maximum value of the crop coefficient. This is the fraction of ground cover associated to maximum values of crop coefficient. And here is the crop coefficient at the end <coughs> of stage one. And this is the fraction of ground cover. In other words, the crop coefficient will be increasing in proportion to ground cover. Sometimes we might need also to estimate the actual evapotranspiration. First, we calculate the potential evapotranspiration as a product of crop coefficient by ETO. And then we can correct that if we are performing uh, deficit irrigation using this equation where delta is the average um, soil water content, delta PVP is the water content at permanent wilting point, and, de and, and theta FC is at field capacity. With that, we can reduce the crop coefficient if we want to include the effect of water stress. The alternative to using the FAO met methodology would be to estimate transpiration and soil evaporation independently. We can calculate evapor soil evaporation using the equations that we have seen previously, and also we can calculate transpiration using an equation like this, where FPI is the fraction of intercepted PAR, KTF is a coefficient and ETO is the reference ET. The coefficient is round one for annuals, annual crops and evergreen trees, and between 1.2 and 1.8 for deciduous fruit trees. It is interesting just to mention that these equations might break when we are evaporating from wet canopies. After rainfall, of, after sprinkler irrigation, when the canopy is wet, evaporation will proceed very fast. We can calculate that using the pema monteith equation with RC, canopy resistance, equal to zero. And it, that will imply a large rate of evaporation and that will occur until all the water intercepted by the canopy is evaporated. The amount of water intercepted by the canopy is around roughly to 0.25 by the leaf area index. One thing that happens is that when we have direct evaporation from the plant the transpiration will be reduced. The reduction in transpiration due to the wetting of the canopy is illustrated in this figure where we plot the time course of transpiration of a single walnut tree close to Cordoba in June 2009. And we, the, and this arrow marks the start of a rainfall that lasted around one hour until here. And after rainfall, the transpiration was reduced almost to zero.